Welcome to part two of Modern Two, Art of the 20th Century. We were talking about Jackson Pollock when we left off, and we're still talking about Jackson Pollock. Now, he created a new style of art called action painting. And this is the process where the artist drips and splashes paint across huge canvases. Pollock used house paint, and he worked in a spontaneous fashion. During the period from the late 1940s to the mid-50s, when he did his action painting, he was undergoing psychoanalysis, and so exploring the realm of his unconscious mind. Like the Surrealists, he believed that his art accessed the unconscious mind. Let's speak a bit about the Surrealists, because they were most strongly influenced by Sigmund Freud. You need to remember that. So let's go back to Jackson Pollock. He believed his art accessed the unconscious mind, and that by painting in a spontaneous fashion, he could bypass conscious thought. In viewing his work, we're seeing a moment in time as experienced by the artist, pure expression. That was his idea behind his work. Now, Pollock lived a fast-paced life in the art world, and he struggled with alcoholism until he died at the age of 44. One interesting fact about his death is he was out uh, joyriding with his girlfriend in a convertible and was probably a little soused, but he was celebrating having just sold his first painting, at, uh, sold the painting at the highest price he had ever sold a painting for, which was $5,000. So he went out to celebrate, and that was that. So one interesting uh, form of art style to come out of the last half of the century is pop art. And in the notes here it says one of the most controversial styles. But I would say pop art is really kind of here to stay, as I notice that many of my painting students love the pop art style. And it's a great way to simplify a form down to its most basic expression and to present something quite beautiful. Well, pop artists um, they reacted to artists being bombarded by images in advertising and popular media. Remember that as television came on board, um, we were just we we became bombarded as human beings, as a society, by so many more images than had ever hit the human consciousness before. So people reacted. Now pop art came from a celebration of that, really, or making fun of that. Um, what they often did, the pop artists, would be make art out of the mundane in very incongruous ways, ways that didn't make sense. Now we see this in The Giant Clothespin by Klaus Oldenburg. He did a lot of such work. Um, and this sculpture was commissioned in Philadelphia in honor of the bicentennial. The two halves of the clothespin are supposed to represent an embrace. And what Klaus Oldenburg said is that the idea is that both parts have to come together for it to function. So it's really about love. Which brings us to the one up at the top. It was a very popular sculpture that became a kind of a logo of the era that was created by the artist Robert Indiana. Let's talk about Robert Lichtenstein, who was a pop artist who seized upon the imagery in comic strips to make his art. He took images that were usually seen in little bitty squares in newspaper and he made them huge to a size of about four by six feet. In doing this, he had to change the image in order for it to read well at such a large size, and yet he wanted to remain true to the image. His work shows the conventions in style that must be followed for a comic strip to be readable to millions of people. Later, Lichtenstein applied this practice to works by Picasso and Mondrian, reinterpreting them as comic strips. Oh, and now we have Andy Warhol, who's a pretty popular guy, a favorite. Um, he began his career in advertising. In 1960, as the pop art movement was emerging, he changed his direction, creating art that documented popular culture. He used the printmaking medium of silkscreen and thus was able to produce his images in a variety of forms. His images of Marilyn Monroe above represent the star, not the human. That was what he was doing, is he was pointing out how her image had become so much more important than who she actually was. In Coca-Cola to the right, he's reproduced this image that is so commonplace it could go unnoticed. 
Warhol felt that he wanted his art to celebrate the mundane. He wrote, The pop artists did images that anybody walking down Broadway could recognize in a split second. All the great modern things that the abstract expressionists tried not to notice at all. So you can see he had a bit of an attitude. He had a studio called the Fun Factory that was the center of the avant-garde movement in New York in the 1960s. And I don't know if you've heard about the Fun Factory, but it was also a center of quite a lot of um, drug use, wild parties. Um, several punk bands came through there. Um, you know, and by its very nature, that kind of a lifestyle has, shall we say, a shelf life, and it all ended. Now, I like Dwayne Hanson. He's a lot of fun. He was an artist who combined pop art and realism with a touch of humor. He definitely had humor. He depicted sort of ordinary looking people with exacting detail. His earlier work dealt with large social issues, but around 1970 he changed direction, saying, you can say more with a whisper than with screaming and hollering. <laughs> he began making sculptures that were intended to hold a mirror up to certain aspects of American culture. To the right we have the shoppers, and to the left is the tourists. Both of these works are life-sized, made of poly resin, using real hair, clothes, and accessories. When, seen the, when these are seen in museums, they often look just like living people. And again, to refer to the Nelson Atkins Museum, there's a museum guard there that is one of Hansen's works, and he's looking less and less Dwayne Hansen was an artist who combined pop art and realism in his work, and he had a great sense of humor. He depicted ordinary people with exacting detail. He'd actually make molds of people and then give them hair and paint them and really make them look realistic, and then he would dress them. Now, his earlier work dealt with large social issues, but around 1970, he kind of changed his perspective, saying, you know, you can say more with a whisper than with screaming and hollering. That was a quote from Mr. Hansen. He began making sculptures that were intended to hold a mirror up to certain aspects of American culture. To the right above, we have the shoppers, and to the left, the tourists. Both works are life-sized, made of poly resin using real hair, clothes, and accessories. When seen in museums, they're often mistaken for living people. I think there's a Hanson work at the Crystal Bridges Museum, and there's examples of Warhol and of most of these other artists that we're looking at today. Now let's talk a bit about realism. Above we have Richard, Ellis, Richard Estes's work from 1973. Now realism could be seen as a rebellion against the focus on abstraction in the early part of the century. But it's also just a non-emotional portrayal of a scene, and it in his work, in um, Estes's work, you can really see the influence of abstraction. By showing everyday reality in minute detail, the realists hope to get the viewer to notice these scenes in a new way. Now, in contrast, we have the realist painter Audrey Flack, and she shows ordinary objects in ways that they're arranged to evoke an emotional response. And I encourage you to really look at Audrey Flack's work, F-L-A-C-K, look her up, because these are amazing paintings, and they do have um, uh, quite a strong emotional impact, and they're also really big, like six by eight feet, something like that. So throughout the century, oops, as art moved further away from realistic portrayal, some artists, such as the artist Andrew Wyeth, maintained classical traditions, but he incorporated elements from modern art. Here's an egg tempera painting called Christina's World. This is about the same time that Jackson Pollock is doing his action paintings. Now here he portrays a sense of isolation in this very precise style that was his trademark. Now what if you knew that this model was paralyzed from the waist down? Would that change the way that you viewed the piece? Well that is true about this artist, about this subject. Another artist who combined realism and abstraction was M.C. Escher. He was a Dutch artist, and he portrayed realistic scenes, but he often added an element of unreality. In his later life, he created visual puzzles using positive and negative space. So let's look at earthworks. 
In response to the growing influence of economics, money, on the art scene, some artists sought to create massive works that could not possibly be bought or sold. They worked with stone, dirt, and other natural elements to create art that was part of the natural world. Here we have Spiral Jetty by Robert Smithson, created between 1969 and 70. Now it's made of rock and dirt and it spirals for 1,500 feet into the Great Salt Lake in Utah. Part of this artist's idea was to explore how the natural elements would gradually destroy his work. Uh, he felt like the salty water in the lake represented the origins of life. Now this is on the bottom, this is how it used to look from the road. But I just heard from another student that um, Spiral Jetty is sank into the lake now and what is left is a sign. And perhaps you can see a slight uh, little bit is left of this great earthwork that has in fact been taken up by the Great Salt Lake. And you can consider the works of Goldsworthy or um, Maya Lin, other artists that have done the earthworks. Now here we have a very influential architect, Miles van der Rohe. And he's, you can look at his work in contrast to the last slide. This architect pioneered that minimalist uniform modern skyscraper with no embellishments built around the steel cage structure. In his work, he believed in that maxim that less is more. And he eliminated all unnecessary building um, elements. He eliminated all unnecessary elements from his buildings. This clean, modernist look really threatened to strip the character out of America's cities. So by the mid-1970s, architects began adding elements from classic architecture back into their building. And now it's come really around full circle because the classical style and restoring old buildings has become quite popular. Oh, let's talk about Frank Lloyd Wright. He's considered to be one of the greatest architects of the 20th century. Among many of his accomplishments was the development of what we call the prairie style, which became the ranch home that really fills our suburban cities to this day. Wright's houses emphasize internal space over external structure. He felt there should be an openness and a continuity throughout a structure, and he believed in the maxim of no posts, no columns. So he used engineering such as the cantilever to achieve this aim. Now what cantilever means is it doesn't really show up as well in this little diagram as you see in Falling Water House. So look at this walkway. It goes way out over the waterfall and it's anchored way back here into the mountain. So that's what a cantilever is. Now this is a, as I say, Falling Water House is built over a waterfall and you should remember that. Also that it used the cantilever. Now let's wrap up this discussion of art this lecture on art to talk about art moving into the next millennium. We haven't really looked so much at digital art which is a huge topic which again could take up a whole class. But now as art does move into the next millennium there appears to be both a desire to return to classical principles and a movement to work with new media in order to continue to explore new territory. Those that are pursuing more classical styles do have the benefit of the innovations of the last two centuries to enhance their work. So that creates a sort of a balance. There's a lot more of an attitude nowadays that really anything goes. As, and the artists they explore new media have the knowledge that there are no limits to the possibility of creative expression. This concludes the audio lecture on Modern 2 and thanks for listening.